Kevin, as you know, chemical recycling is urgently needed to help us in our transition to a circular economy. Um, we need to divert more waste from incineration, from landfilling, from exporting. Um, how would you define chemical recycling technologies and, and what do they do exactly? And maybe another one, why do we need different types of chemical yeah. recycling technologies? Um, so chemical recycling differs from mechanical recycling in the fact that bonds are actually broken. So if you think about uh, molecules, you can connect them and they are, have long bonds. With chemical recycling, you will break those bonds. With mechanical recycling, you will keep those bonds intact. And then you would say, okay, let's keep those bonds intact. Yeah, that that's, will be the perfect world. Um, unfortunately, that's not always possible because um, if you look at waste material, it contains yeah, uh, quite some uh, components sometimes that we don't like or that uh, ended up there by accident. And also for chemical recycling, we talk about chemical recycling technologies because there is more than one technology um, yeah. in that area. Indeed, um, because waste is also so diverse. Uh, on the one hand, they have sorting. Uh, this will sort out different streams. This makes it possible to create different solutions for different streams, which are better than others. In the ideal case, of course, you want to go for 100% recycled material. Mm -hmm. um, so if you sort, you can optimize uh, different technologies. On the other hand, then you will see that some waste streams are better than others. And for the best waste streams, uh, for example, uh, think about uh, polyolefinic waste, you would use pyrolysis. For the not so clean waste streams, you would go to gasification. So they're actually complementary. No. And this is how the whole system works. So it's not one black box. It really is multiple techniques and you always try to choose the best technique that gives you the highest recycled content. Yeah, and obviously to go to that circular economy, we need a lot of different complementary technologies to go there. Indeed. Uh, so um, think about uh, polycarbonates that you have, mm -hmm. then yeah, you will need a completely different technology uh, for that one. Or think about polystyrene, then uh, if you can sort it out, we have developed here a technology which allows us to recover more than 90% of the styrene monomer again. Yeah, and obviously you touch on an, another important part as part of these technologies, it's yields. Um, you mentioned contamination is an issue we deal with. Obviously, I'm sure you're trying to optimize yields as well. You can get out of chemical recycling technologies. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's why also technology is evolving. Uh, so like in this unit, we you go for a liquid. We're also developing a single step technology, which can basically go directly to the, the building box, go back to the monomers in one step. And then our yeah, yields of, of these olefins increase from 60 to 90 percent. We are here in your pilot facilities in Ghent. Uh, can you explain us how these pilot facilities help us advance and help you in actually getting chemical recycling technologies to a stage yeah. where they can be fully commercially uh, operational. Um, you can consider, consider us as basically as a sort of one-stop shop. Yeah. Uh, we have the full value chain uh, starting from waste sorting uh, with among others my colleague Steven de Meester um, to making the intermediates, uh, like with pyrolysis, you create an intermediate liquid. We can transform that liquid back to the building blocks and then we can also make polymers again. Uh, and because we have this full value chain, then of course we can demonstrate really from the waste to the polymer. And that's, that's really as essential in, in this context because every step matters mm -hmm. and you need representative samples. You have to be able to make those samples and uh, having them all in one location, of course, is, is, the, yeah, is the dream, of course, of any researcher, of any research team. Yeah. Obviously, over the last years, a lot of work has been done and a lot of work has been done here in University of Ghent. What would you say are the key steps forwards we've taken over the last couple of years? 
What have you seen in terms of evolution and progress? Yeah. Two very important things. One is on the input side. Yeah. What is essential? Uh, we have around uh, 40 to 50 million tons of plastic waste in Europe. We want to be able to process that full amount. I think that on the input side, we made enormous progress that we can handle also quite impure feeds. Yeah. On the output sides, we really want to create products um, that have the right properties. And this also means that the intermediates like this with this machine, uh, we have created pyrolysis oil that you can feed that directly to a steam cracker. Steam cracker is the uh, key unit that produces base chemicals, produces ethylene, which is then used for making polymers. And the fact that, that we can create oils, which for example are now free of metals, that's an enormous step forward because otherwise yeah, nobody will even accept your oil. Mm -hmm. So these are two uh, uh, very big steps which allow us to close uh, really the, the cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you highlight, taking waste as a feedstock compared to what we've typically been using as a feedstock obviously comes with challenges. And I guess that's where a lot of your work is looking into as well. Yeah. Um, a big emphasis is really on this, these uh, impurities. Eh? Um, what is waste? Uh, uh, when I started tw 10 years ago, I believed that polymers, uh, polyethylene and polypropylene, only contained carbon and hydrogen. <laughs> I've been uh, pleasantly surprised that the full periodic system is in there. <laughs> uh, for waste, then, uh, it's also quite unpredictable. You have to create a technology which is compatible with that. A recycling plant will have a capacity of 50 to 100,000 tons. If you compare that to a steam cracker, of a million tons. Mm -hmm. For the time being, it will be uh, only part of the stream will come from recycled content. That's just, just reality because of the uh, uh, circle of availability of waste in, in a certain area. So in all these, these aspects, we, we have made tremendous progress. And, and, uh, but okay, still a lot of work needs to be done. Going to a circular economy requires a lot of collaboration, collaboration along the value chain. I believe in collaboration. Yeah. Um, as a single faculty member, you can only do this much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I would like to congratulate you as well with a, a very prestigious uh, grant you just uh, recently received. How will this help uh, the work you're doing here and advancing us? Mm -hmm. uh, towards that climate neutrality in a circular economy? It basically is essential that uh, we reduce our CO2 footprint in general for any application. Uh, think about uh, our cars, and, and, but also for making chemicals. And if you look at making chemicals or making the plastics, then they have a CO2 impact today. And the main reason is because we use combustion. We, we have to create heat, and what we do is we, come, yeah, we put in a gas and we heat that up, and it creates CO2. At the same time, it creates heat. Mm -hmm. um, and in my ERC project, we want to renew, use renewable electricity completely, but also combine that with plastic waste as a resource. Yeah? And, and again, yeah, we want to make uh, the, the plastics again, um, but working on uh, reducing the, the CO2 emissions of making the chemical building blocks by avoiding combustion, so electrifying the, the steam cracking part, and on the other hand, uh, reducing what I will call the scope 3 emissions, uh, the emissions related to the starting materials by using waste, and that would be uh, a tremendous achievement. We would say we're at a pretty critical moment in time for chemical recycling. We start commercial size units being operational, um, how do you see the big challenges uh, ahead to really put that in place at mm. a big scale? Um, maybe the biggest challenge is legislation. Well, um, legislation will create the business cases huh? and they are strongly coupled. Um, and also there's the, what I will call the geopolitical context. Huh? Um, 
Europe uh, it, it is very competitive the world it's it's a globalized world um, so how Europe can survive in that context is, is a challenge um, but on the other hand that waste is really an opportunity mm -hmm. and by implementing waste as a feedstock instead of fossil resources we can drastically reduce that co2 impact mm -hmm. We remove waste and we reduce our CO2 footprint. Yeah, and you highlight, obviously, Europe uh, lives in a global context as well. And, and we sometimes think in Europe, we're pretty advanced on circularity, on chemical recycling. From your angle, how do you look at that and, and see how things are evolving in Europe versus in other geographies? Um, from a research point, from a technology development point, we're way ahead. However, eh, uh, when you have an advantage, catching up is always easy because you, mm -hmm. when you catch up, you don't make the mistakes. Eh, you can read the mistakes of others. Mm -hmm. So catching up is relatively straightforward. And um, in the end, eh, we have technology providers. So we are creating technology. But even if you would make the decision today to go for a certain investment, it typically would take three, four years, considering permits and so on, to build actually a facility. So if you set targets by 2030, we're now 2024, we end up in 2028, if you would make the decision today. And then otherwise you have to make your business case even. So you easily end up with 2030, eh, uh, even today. So eh, that's really is a sense of urgency. And as long as you don't create clarity on policy, nobody will make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest issues. Everybody's waiting. Everybody's waiting what will happen. Mm -hmm. And in the end, this means that the investments are going elsewhere. And you can only spend your $1 billion at one location. Then, uh, so that's, really, that's also the urgency. You cannot postpone this to 2026 and so on. You cannot wait. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we need clarity yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Yeah. yeah, it's important that chemically recycled material gets integrated in our existing assets and investments are needed and from all the work you're doing here, everything has an impact on the next steps in the process. So, so from that point of view, yeah, then uh, if then on top the legislation is also unfavorable. That's very concerning because you really also create an unfair competition yep. between two different continents. We are really at uh, a turning point in, in time, uh, turning point for Europe, I, I believe. Uh, um, it's, it's also politically important. Uh, I think we realize that we are very dependent on uh, countries outside Europe for our resources. Um, you can do that to a certain extent, but maybe we overdid it. And uh, by using waste, and waste is one of the few materials Europe actually has, <laughs> to, be, to tell the truth. Yeah. We don't have lots of fossil resources, we don't have a lot of minerals and so on, but we have waste. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't we use it mm -hmm. uh, to make new products again? So all these things are, in the end, if you look at it from, uh, from the big picture, from a helicopter view, you say, Okay, why are we not doing this? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Why are we not investing in this? It should have happened already. Yeah? Uh, because otherwise, yeah, others will. Yeah? Everybody sees this. The issue is that sometimes we are a bit slow. Mm -hmm. yeah? And then people yeah. overtake us. Exactly. And strategic uh, autonomy for Europe is very important as well. So. There are plenty of examples where we were too slow and that other people overtake us or they, they uh, have a create a different market economy. This is the same issue that we can have in this case. So let us not make the same mistake.